Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's a great privilege today to have Dr. Marlene Freeman um, as our expert uh, that we can learn from. Uh, I met Dr. Freeman when she was a rookie resident, and it was pretty obvious even then that she had great things ahead of her. Uh, she's now a full professor at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, she's the associate director for the Center for Women's Mental Health at Mass General Hospital, uh, which has an extraordinary website, uh, which we'll come back to uh, answering a lot of very specific questions. Uh, she's also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to be able to have a conversation uh, with Dr. Freeman uh, on the topic that we haven't really developed much at NAMI, but it does come up. And so I was delighted that we could get one of the leading experts uh, to talk about it. So Dr. Freeman, I wanna thank you uh, for joining. And uh, unlike her background, she is not in Arizona. She's in rainy Boston, just like me. Uh, so Dr. Freeman, thank you again uh, for joining and I look forward to this conversation. My pleasure, thanks for having me. All right, so let's start with a lot of specific questions came in. We had over hundred questions come in beforehand. We're not gonna do a lot of what's the best time, you know, to take Zoloft during pregnancy. I wanna go big picture with you. How do you think about before you get pregnant, how do you advise people to think about that if they don't have a history of mental health, vulnerability, if they have a family history of mental health, vulnerability, or if they have a known history? So that's a lot of questions right in there. And thank you. Sure. So first of all, um, when just thinking about um, pregnancy, we want to think about individuals or women of reproductive potential. So I'll use the word women a lot, but I want to be inclusive, you know, as we, you know, want to be welcoming to everyone. But, you know, in terms of women's mental health, um, we want to think about not only those who are planning pregnancy, um, but girls who are younger than that age, um, and individuals who might become pregnant. So what's important to keep in mind in this field, and just for, for the public in general, is that about half of pregnancies in this country and globally are unplanned. And that's really staggering when you, I think, when you think about it, because that means that, you know, whatever people are doing in their life, including getting treated for, you know, often chronic and serious disorders, you know, they're, they have to keep in mind the possibility um, that they may have a surprise pregnancy. And so healthcare prescribers also need to keep that in mind. And I think, we don't really educate healthcare providers enough about this. So, you know, for, for girls and women of reproductive potential, we always want to pick medicines from the very beginning on which would be reasonable to go through a pregnancy and postpartum because so many of the disorders, um, uh, you know, need, need treatment across um, the, the, the times, even if someone is pregnant or postpartum. So, um, you know, we know that women are at higher risk for depression and most anxiety disorders across the reproductive years. And, and so um, many women are not diagnosed, come to pregnancy and might get screened for depression and have um, what, you know, the first time either a recognized depression or a new onset depression. Um, and for, for other women, they've been treated earlier and you know what what i think we also want to keep in mind when we think about unplanned pregnancies is that you know sometimes someone will start treatment and they'll say you know i'm not planning pregnancy that's not on my radar I, i'm not considering that as part of my um, treatment planning but you know part of what we keep in mind also is that if someone is well and they have a chronic disorder their plans may change over time so if someone is not well and they're starting treatment we still want them to be on something reasonable if they would you know be at a different point in life and want to become pregnant or if they would have an unplanned pregnancy we would want to make sure that whatever the person was treated with from a medication standpoint would be something that would be totally reasonable um, so we always want that in mind. But what I think is so important also about this field is that, you know, I think generally psychiatrists are not trained 
well enough in, in um, working with women who are pregnant or postpartum. So they often feel uncomfortable. OBGYNs are on the front lines with patients who may be having psychiatric disorders, and they may be the healthcare provider that the patient is most comfortable with, but they may not feel comfortable treating mental health on the front lines. Um, primary care doctors, um, uh, you know, some are really excellent in terms of psych treating psychiatric illnesses, some are not very comfortable, but, uh, and they also have very limited time per patient. But what I heard one colleague say early in my career that really resonates is we want to make sure that whatever door a woman knocks on is the right door. So it really has to be, you know, a very collaborative approach across disciplines to make sure that people find what they need. So that was the, the before. It's a, great, it's a great answer. Um, let's talk about medicines that you consistently advise against women of reproductive age using. Do you have any medicines that are just kind of, I wouldn't pursue this um, yeah. as you think about it? I know every individual situation is different, but you've researched this tremendously. And I'm very interested in how you think about that. So in an abstract way, you know, we always want to lead with medications that are best known, best studied during pregnancy. A lot of the psychiatric medications like SSRI antidepressants are better studied than most classes of medicines across fields of medicine in pregnancy. So there are some medicines that we have a lot of information about, a lot of data, and, and there are some medicines that we don't have as much about that we're trying to learn more about. And um, there are some medicines that we know about which don't look so good. And I will say that the medication that worries me the most is valproic acid or Depakote. So it is by far in psychiatry, the worst medicine um, for pregnancy. And I can't say enough bad things about it. So um, the more we learn about valproic acid, the worse it looks in women of reproductive age. So keeping in mind, that about half of pregnancies are not planned. You know, the woman was not timing to become pregnant. Valproic acid or Depakote has a very high risk, like about like up to 10 to 12% risk of major central nervous system malformations, like major birth defects that occur before most women know they're pregnant. So very, very early in pregnancy before women would even know that they were pregnant. And then it gets worse also from there too. So then you have this risk of a very, very terrible birth defect. And then also, our, we know this because our neurology colleagues have done such an amazing job keeping pregnancy registries for anticonvulsant medications and has, have followed pregnancies and children out for many years. Kids exposed in utero to valproic acid do more poorly on neurocognitive tests at age three, age six, and probably further out. You know, they, they're, you know, they've been studied for years. And so really one of my, I feel like one of my missions on the planet is to make sure people know that because women are treated with valproic acid as a mood stabilizer, sometimes for migraines or seizures. And of all the medicines that we potentially come in contact with, it's really the worst in our field. So in my mind, when we're talking about women, I think that women should not um, like be in the same room as valproic acid until they're like postmenopausal. Like there's no method of birth control that I think is reliable enough to introduce valproic acid. And another reason for that too is that, you know, so many disorders that we treat are chronic or recurrent. And so once someone is well, you know, coming off the medicine carries a, a tremendous risk of someone being unwell. And, you know, we, we see this all the time in, in people finding out that they're pregnant and, and they're afraid and they stop their medicine and then the dis disorder recurs. It's not just a matter of putting the medicine back, like stopping the medicine because someone's scared, they crash, they're not doing well, and then just put the medicine back in their well. You know, the disorders that we treat can be incredibly humbling and hard to treat. And so sometimes if someone stops a medicine that kept them well, sometimes they're ill for a very long period of time and it's hard to get them better. Like they could, um, pay so dearly for stopping a medicine that worked for them. So that's why it's so imperative that we choose medicines from the very beginning that would be reasonable if someone became pregnant 
And we, it's really on us as healthcare providers to talk to patients as we talk about risk and benefits of, of other possible side effects. If we talk about, you know, if you would become pregnant on this medicine, this is what I would want you to know. So I think that it's just something that we need to think about from the very beginning. So Depakote valproic acid is an anticonvulsant that our field kind of stole from neurology, like many uh, of the innovations in our field. We observe that it helps people because it's out on the market. And for in this example, people with bipolar disorder seem to respond to it. So your point is really clear. If you're of reproductive age, stay away from Depakote valproic acid just as a, a core construct. So let's transition a little bit. So let's say you know, a woman lives with bipolar disorder and you mentioned stopping your meds. Let's just talk a little bit about how you think about the role of medications and the role of other supports in a woman who's planning to get pregnant on how you think about that. So clearly if you're on Depakote, you've gotten off of it because you went to Dr. Freeman's webinar. And uh, I encourage people to put questions in the chat. More than a hundred were submitted beforehand and I'm trying to cover them in broad strokes. Uh, but if you have specific questions, I'll do my best to get to them in our conversation. So what about that idea? I have bipolar disorder, I'm planning to become pregnant. Obviously I'm not on Depakote because I came to this webinar and I, I read your literature, but maybe let's say I'm taking another compound like lithium. And I was taught about you know uh, the potential for first trimester vulnerabilities for cardiac malformations way back in the day. And so we were cautioned, you know, to think differently about lithium. But what is the current thinking? Because you're up on all this literature. So it's true that lithium is a known teratogen, meaning it does carry an increased risk of birth defects, specifically cardiovascular. Um, but the risk is very small. And um, as many of you know, you know, these are just not interchangeable medicines. So someone may be a responder to lithium, it might work so well for them and something else might not work so well for them. And these days we also see patients on regimens where they might be on more than one medicine that may work synergistically for them. So they may be on lithium at a lower dose than we used to see and another medication. But the risk of lithium and, the, and that risk of first trimester exposure and cardiovascular malformations is very small. So the absolute risk is still small. So there's a statistically increased risk, okay. but still small compared to Depakote, which is like, you know, bad, 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 bad. With lithium, um, you know, this is one of the things that I've really seen evolve across, um, across the years as I've been in this field. So say across the past two decades, you know, I think when I was starting out in this field, we really did try to, to taper individuals off medicine for a first mm -hmm. trimester and then add back during the pregnancy after this period of like cardi cardiac formation was passed. And that's individuals with bipolar disorder. So they or get pregnant, you transition them off and then. But we in the olden days. In the old days, yes. Okay, so, but now, you know, and so, and I should say, you know, you know, based on my background, I, sh I should say um, I really started working in this field in Arizona where I was really on my own. I didn't have a group. You know, I read everything I could, including a lot of things that came from Mass General, but I wasn't part of a perinatal psychiatry group. So I felt very much like on my own um, and, and uh, just reading everything I could. Um, but now I am very privileged to be in probably the largest um, group practicing perinatal psychiatrists, like maybe on the planet. So I've been at Mass General 15 years and every week we have um, the opportunity to, to have rounds. So we talk about these things extensively. So, you know, over the years, one of the things that I think as a group we've really agonized over, and I think we've really changed um, some of our practice about is whether or not it's worth the risk to, to decrease or stop a medication for an individual with bipolar disorder in a first trimester. Because what we've seen so many times is that an individual will make sometimes even the most modest change to her regimen and she'll become very ill. And we've seen people need to be hospitalized, have suicide attempts, have episodes of bipolar depression that might take like months or even years to recover from. And, um, and, and so 
in general, we want people to be on medications that would be reasonable to stay on through pregnancy. And so we do make sure that individuals are educated about this. So before pregnancy, ideally, but we often don't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But for many individuals who are lithium responders, staying the course with lithium may be the best plan to keep them well. Now, the other thing about lithium, though, that is complicated, um, but still doesn't really change how we practice is that it's the one medicine that is the most complicated for breastfeeding because there have been enough case reports of adverse events in infants, um, higher blood levels compared to other medicines if a baby is being breastfed while the mom is taking lithium. And so it used to be contraindicated by the American Academy of Pediatrics to breastfeed while taking lithium. It's now not quite so you know, harsh in terms of the recommendation. So we generally advise against lithium and breastfeeding, um, but I have had patients who've done it. And um, what we really wanna make sure is in place is um, that there's a collaborative pediatrician and the baby um, has some uh, blood work checked. But the, the situations where I've seen it, um, you know, it's really a compromise. You know, these are complicated decisions that are very collaborative. Mm -hmm. And patients have to decide, you know, sort of what they want to do, you know, balancing their mental health and their wellness with, you know, you know their decisions around pregnancy and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So I will say, while we're on the topic of breastfeeding and bipolar disorder, that um, one of the mo I actually, let me just start by uh, talking a little bit about breastfeeding and sleep, because I will say that the topic that I've seen the most tears shed in my office about by far, nothing else comes close, nothing comes close, is um, the topic of breastfeeding and not necessarily related to medication at all. So um, for those of you, some of you may be uh, painfully familiar with this, but for some of you who like haven't really been in this you know sort of zone you know women are um there's there's a public health message out there to breastfeed it's a very strong message um and and it's a public health message importantly so it's you know a big overriding goal for more people to know about breastfeeding and to breastfeed and the message to women in general is to breastfeed exclusively from the breast um, and establish breastfeeding and the recommendation has been extended i think from like one year to two years or something, you know, something that is just undoable for most individuals. Um, but each individual, um, especially if they're at a quote unquote baby friendly hospital is told is really, you know, pushed to breastfeed. Now, I just wanna say, I wanna put it out there. I'm not arguing against the benefits of breastfeeding in any way from a nutritional standpoint, breastfeeding is best if it works out well. Um, but there's probably a very complicated bi-directional relationship between stress, psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, and breastfeeding difficulty. And when women are told that breastfeeding is best, and they're making this delicate transition in life to being a new mother, and they're told they're doing it wrong, that is like just devastating for individuals. Um, so it's very important, I think, that people hear from us that, it, that the most important thing is their wellness, that they're well and they're able to bond with their baby because there are few areas in mental health that are as proven as the importance of maternal mental health on child development. So having, it's mostly depression that's been best studied, but having a mother with depression is associated with almost all negative outcomes uh, um, you know, across child development. And so we really want to emphasize to women during pregnancy and in the postpartum that the, the, the goal is to be well. And so if a baby is breastfed, fine. If the baby's not breastfed, fine. You know, like the, but, but in, women have so much pressure on them and it's all, almost always like open season on new mothers. Like there's mm -hmm. so much and it's out there in a loud. So the tears in your office this topic, more than all other topics put together, are about the idea that I'm not meeting some ideal that my right. healthcare provider instructed me to attend to that I'm not able to do for whatever reason. So what happens is, you know, women um, are in the hospital, they're told to breastfeed, they go home. And if an individual is breastfeeding, so newborn babies need to eat every one or two hours, maybe every three hours if you're lucky, and it takes a while to feed them, and then they're up for a while, and then that's like... 24 seven for weeks. And it really takes like, 
you know, four plus months or so for babies to start consolidating some nighttime sleep if you're lucky. So that means that if a new mom is exclusively breastfeeding from the breast, she is never getting any consecutive sleep. Right. And for individuals who are vulnerable, who have psychiatric disorders, the postpartum may be the most exquisitely vulnerable time for very serious illness, and especially for women with bipolar disorder. So there's mm. an increased risk of mood episodes, postpartum psychosis, so if we're fortunate enough to work with patients during the pregnancy, we start talking with them across the pregnancy about how to get a sleep plan. However they're going to feed, we want them to have a sleep plan. And you know, if women are lucky enough to have partners, we want them to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. If they have a loved family member, if there's no partner um, who can help. For individuals who have resources, they might line up a night nurse or a night nanny. Um, most people don't have those kind of resources, but what's really important is that our message is not to do that, not to exclusively breastfeed from the breast when the risk is becoming so ill. Mm. So what we recommend is that there's some sleep plan so that women can get some consecutive sleep, which means someone else can help feed the baby at night. And so that means introducing bottles could be pump breast milk, but could be formula. We have to sometimes, you know, give women the message that giving a baby formula is not failure. And it might sound ridiculous if you do, if you don't um, talk to a lot of new parents, but the pressure is so immense on new moms to breastfeed that they really feel awful about this. So they go to their breastfeeding class during pregnancy and they're told that they should breastfeed exclusively. They, they're told don't introduce bottles, don't introduce pacifiers, or the baby might get nipple confusion and not be able to breastfeed. And so part of our job is to mitigate that message and tell them that nipple confusion doesn't make the top 10 list of things that they need to be worried about. Mm. That, that having enough sleep and support can make all the difference for women being, you know, sometimes very ill or being able to stay well. And so, you know, that's where, you know, we really, and we really want to help bolster women in with support in terms of just this transit transition mm -hmm. because it's so hard it's so difficult so many good points so we talked about a woman who has known bipolar disorder gets pregnant plans to get pregnant let's take a person who has a history of depression and how might you they come to your office they happen to be lucky enough to find you and they say i'm planning to get pregnant i have a history of you know pretty serious depressions but I, I want to have a baby. And how might you think about that with them? Not really so much the specifics, you know, uh, but how do you approach that with somebody who is planning ahead or somebody who says, I have a history of depression. I just found out I'm pregnant. Yeah. So one thing I didn't answer from, from your question before are the non-pharmacologic interventions that are so important. So I can't think of a situation where we would not recommend psychotherapy. So um, individual and or group psychotherapy is an incredibly important part of the piece. Um, we often recommend um, evidence-based therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, but you know these are often tailored to what the individual needs. A resource that offers um, no cost group therapies is Postpartum Support International, and we'll, we'll provide that information so that you can learn more about that. But especially over the past few years with the pandemic, they really increased the number of groups they offer for pregnant women, postpartum women, for partners, um, you know, really diverse groups so that individuals feel comfortable. They offer groups for loss, um, uh, bipolar disorder, you know, uh, almost anxiety disorders, like almost anything you could think of. Um, they offer resources in Spanish, you know, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's really worth checking out. So any individual with any psychiatric disorder Disorder, we're going to recommend um, a form of psychotherapy and and I recommend groups to everyone as well. And part of that is because it's very lonely to be going through this experience and partly because of the stigma. So most women don't talk about these things publicly. You know, people don't um, when they're you know pregnant or postpartum don't generally share this type of information. So almost every woman feels like she's going through it alone mm -hmm. and feels so, so often frightened and alone with it. And so the groups can offer, I think, sort of a kinship of, you know, being able to connect with people who've been in your shoes. Um, and so I think that the groups are incredibly powerful, even for people who haven't done groups before or don't think that they would like a group. Hmm. Now, for, for individuals who have major depressive disorder, you know, what we 
focus on is a lot, you know, what's been the history, you know, the severity, the recurrence, what have they responded uh, with with treatment. Um, and, and, you know, there's such a spectrum of severity. The, the individuals who tend to come to our group, though, have had a, a more recurrent course of illness. They've had more mood episodes, more severe episodes, and often they're coming in and they want to know about the risks and benefits of staying on their medication during pregnancy or restarting their medicine during pregnancy. And that is the right way to think about it. It's a risk benefit assessment. Right. And each each individual's history factors into how you think about that with them. Is that right? And so if it's pre-pregnancy, you know, we want to like share the information that there are some antidepressants like SSRI antidepressants that we know quite a lot about during pregnancy, like fluoxetine, which is Prozac, sertraline, which is Zoloft, um, escitalopram, which is Lexapro, citalopram, which is Celexa, which are often, you know, great first line treatments for many individuals with depression or anxiety. But we often see individuals who are on medicines for which we have no information. And oftentimes they're on those medicines because the other things didn't get them well. And so that makes it a different risk benefit assessment. You know, if someone's been on 30 medicines and, and sometimes that is the case um, and they're on the one thing that's got them well, that makes that risk benefit decision about that medicine much different, even if we know less about it. How about a young woman who um, has a history of a psychosis spectrum disorder who wants to become pregnant? And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, schizoaffective disorder, you know, under good control on antipsychotics. How do you think about that with them? So um, during pregnancy or before pregnancy or both? We're going kind of with the both, the anticipation of it or just finding out that, you know. So... Uh, the first thing is really is is that we have to keep in mind that um, the goal is that they're well, like, at, you know, so then then we talk about like how to achieve that. But the goal is wellness, because a lot we a lot of times people think if they forego treatment at all costs that they're, you know, doing the best for their baby. And we need to really let people know that every major psychiatric disorder is associated with pregnancy and neonatal complications. Um, and long term, the more we learn about in utero exposure to untreated illness, the more we know that that's not good for child development either. So we really want people to be well. And um, I think you had Andy Nuremberg on recently, and I believe this quote is from him. But, you know, one of my um, colleagues once said that there should be a menu of reasonable options. It might have been Gary Sachs or Andy Nuremberg said this. I want to attribute it correctly. And we want to make sure that they understand that being being ill is not on the menu. So we want to come up with the reasonable things and people can have their individual preferences and values. And we want to make sure that these are really collaborative decisions and, you know, have partners, you know, you know, part of the decision, whoever's going to be supportive of the patient, if that's helpful to her. Um, but we want to make sure, um, you know, if someone is going to have a treatment during a pregnancy, especially a medication exposure, we want to make sure that it has the best possible chance of working for her. So what we want to avoid is unnecessary medication exposures during a pregnancy. So we don't want like a lot of medication trials. So if someone is on something that has worked exquisitely well for them, then it, that makes that something that really should be at the at least the top of the consideration, which is why we want to think about things that from the beginning that would be reasonable if someone wants to be pregnant on them. Um, and so the other thing just about the course of pregnancy for someone who's had a, a psychotic illness um, is that the, the postpartum is such a vulnerable time. And the biggest risk of having a severe postpartum illness is being ill during the pregnancy. So the best thing that we can possibly do is sort of, you know, treat it as um, like a deadline. We have, in, you know, until the third trimester to get someone as well as possible. So the aim being like rock solid stable before delivery because the postpartum is such a vulnerable time. And individuals who've had psychotic disorders, particularly bipolar one disorder, are at very high risk of postpartum psychosis, which can be, you know, a lethal illness. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, hard to even talk about it so terrible in terms of some of the manifestations of, you know, increased risk of suicide and infanticide. 
um, but it's it's just imperative that people who are at risk know they're at risk. So individuals who have a history of bipolar disorder, um, untreated disorder, or unwell during pregnancy with a psychotic disorder, um, family history of bipolar disorder can increase the risk as well. Um, but we want to make sure that um, that that we educate that individual's frontline for if anybody who's at high risk for severe postpartum illness because you know so much of the public doesn't know a lot about these things and they don't know what they're dealing with when it's happening in front of them if they ha don't have a lot of experience with psychiatry or mental health so it's really important i think to educate people about you know the worst case scenario we don't want to scare them unnecessarily but if someone is at risk for postpartum psychosis postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, then we want to make sure that they know and if they feel comfortable to bring in, you know, partners and family into that discussion. And ideally, that the therapy will be a major component of that. So therapy is, you know, so important in the perinatal situation because it offers the benefits of psychotherapy plus close monitoring over time. So if someone is starting to become unwell, it can be caught as early as possible by someone who really knows that person. A remarkable, uh, you know, you're a wealth of knowledge here. One of the questions in the Q&A was about the opiate crisis, which, of course, is a big phenomenon in Massachusetts, where you and I both reside. Uh, Suboxone, methadone. I'm planning to get pregnant or I just found out I got pregnant. How do you think about those medication assistant therapies, you know, for opiate uh, um, use disorder? So that's that's actually a wonderful opportunity for me to advertise our website. Um, so the Center for Women's Mental Health at Mass General has a website, which is www.womensmentalhealth.org, um, and we'll we'll provide the resource. Um, so as part of that website, we have blogs written by the editor in chief of our website, who's Dr. Ruda Nonax, um, who has contributed you know so much to this field, and literally this week she did a blog summarizing the most recent data on maintenance treatments for opioid use disorders so looking at methadone buprenorphine finding some, somewhat of an advantage of buprenorphine for patients who are on that in terms of pregnancy outcomes but it generally if someone is on a maintenance treatment the advice is that they absolutely should stay on it across pregnancy and postpartum and that's because you know the risk of withdrawal is so high in terms of complications the risk of um uh, not only overdose, but all the um, variables that come along with illicit use if someone does relapse are so, you know, potentially dangerous for someone who's pregnant or postpartum that it's, uh, it's like 100% advised that they stay on whatever's gotten them well. And so we used to have more data with methadone than we did for buprenorphine, but now we have much more for buprenorphine and the recommendation would be to stay on whatever's gotten them well. And I think more individuals are getting buprenorphine now than than probably methadone. Um, and yeah. so the, the data are so reassuring. It's it's really great. And so that's literally on our blog, like as of like today. Mm. This is the best website I've ever seen in American mental health. I've never seen a site that reviews everything that's happening, what's happening this week. So many of you have asked very specific questions about Lamotrigine in the second trimester, for example. Really important. Spend some time on this website to inform you of what's out there and then talk to your healthcare provider. I want to transition to the complexity. Some people report uh, that their OBs don't really believe in psychiatric medications uh, or their OBs are skeptical of their psychiatric history. And I want to know how you think about that one. Have so, you seen that, first of all? And you know, how do you how do you approach that? So I have seen it, you know, and I, what I think it is, is I just think some, and, and some OBs are fantastic on the front lines with mental health and some OBs are very, very uncomfortable. And I think, you know, just like the rest of society, there are some doctors who, um, who have a, a, a prejudice against psychiatric illness and in individuals who have it. And, and so, you know, there still is a stigma, unfortunately. And, but, but I truly think across disciplines, like in OB, there's a lot of fear. And so most OBGYNs um, 
are on the front lines with mental health. They do not feel like they have appropriate backup from psychiatrists or other mental health care professionals. It's hard to get individuals um, enough help or appropriate help with someone who is really skilled in dealing with pregnancy and postpartum. So a lot of the, the OBs just don't want to be on that front line. And so um, some states have resources to support them. So in Massachusetts and about 23 other states, there are state funded groups to do like phone consultations with OBGYNs who want to use them. A lot of OBs don't want to use them. So some OBs will say to patients that they should just stop all their psychiatric medications like as if they were elective. And so we know, we, we appreciate that that's not so easy, you know, that, that that's not the correct advice for so many of our patients, but they often do hear that. And that's one of the things that's so anxiety provoking to patients is to hear different things from different healthcare providers. So what we want to try and do is, you know, do as much um, across discipline research as we can in healthcare to make sure that individuals are hearing good information from different healthcare providers. And that's one of the things that an organization like, you know, our group or Postpartum Support International really aims to do is really multidisciplinary education. Um, I do also think that, you know, there are certain areas in the country where there are more psychiatrists than others. And there are certain areas where their OBs are just called upon to do more of this and sometimes really do an excellent job um, with limited resources. So, you know, I think that um, sort of depending where you are, um, the, your experience with an OBGYN group might be different. Um, let's talk a little bit about health inequities in pregnancy and some of the outcomes. I mean, this has become quite clear that we live in a society with a lot of health inequities. Um, how do you think about that? Uh, are projects like McPat for Moms trying to address that? Medicaid expansion isn't uh, evident in many states. NAMI advocates for Medicaid ex expansion in many states, by the way, with our policy team. How do you think about that as a meta problem and what might uh, an average person do about it? So there are advocacy groups like Postpartum Support International that are addressing this, which have like um, crisis lines and warm lines and groups um, and resources specifically for um, different traditionally underrepresented groups um, so that everyone feels welcome and that they have a place. Um, and there are also resources like the state funded groups to support healthcare providers wherever they are. Um, because, um, you know, very often an individual in a, in a underrepresented group or a disadvantaged group might not be able to see necessarily a perinatal psychiatry consultation, and they might not want to, to go find someone that they don't necessarily trust. But the, the idea of backup to their own healthcare provider, I think it might help us just tremendously in terms of being able to help more, more women. One of the things that... Um, that our group has done um, starting um, like almost exactly four years ago. So as we were being sent home from the hospital with the COVID pandemic, we made our rounds, which you know we value so much virtual, um, our weekly rounds. And so a lot of colleagues across the country knew we were going virtual and asked to join us. Um, and so instead of like expanding our own group's rounds, what we did is we created um, virtual rounds at the Center for Women's Mental Health for healthcare providers um, so that they can participate in a learning uh, and community experience around perinatal mental health, regardless of where they are. So we actually have callers who call in from, you know, rural areas and underserved areas, like from other countries, you know, dealing with like all sorts of different populations to be able to learn and present cases. And I really think that the key is really making those kind of educational experiences um, available because we want to make sure that like the front line has the resources that they need. Let's talk about um, neurostimulation. So there was a question today about transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. And in the pre-submitted questions, more than 100 questions, there was a question about the role of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, or shock treatment for severe mood disorders. I wanted to ask your take on those because it's come up now more than once. So um, ECT is 
an absolutely important tool to keep in mind for severe illness during pregnancy and postpartum. And we often do refer patients for ECT who are, are not well and, you know, really ill. And um, I think that um, for in general for patients who are pregnant, um, you know, I think at least in Massachusetts, um, uh, the, gen the general hospitals are the ones that can offer ECT. So the freestanding psychiatric hospitals, I think, are less likely to feel comfortable offering that to a pregnant woman. The only situation I've really encountered is that very late in the third trimester, there may be um, uh, some concerns about complications with anesthesia, where um, it may not be uh, offered and you know might be deferred until the woman has delivered but we absolutely keep ect in mind for patients who would benefit from it um and then tms is you know is really newer you know it's not um the same gold standard for very severe illness you know but a lot of patients who you know want to minimize medication or have more treatment resistant illness like have pursued tms there's been limited study for safety and efficacy specifically in the perinatal population. So some of that came from University of Pennsylvania where they have done you know, relatively small studies but look extremely promising for pregnant women. Um, but you know, those play extremely different roles in terms of, of what we have to offer. So ECT in selected circumstances much better studied than the newer TMS or transcranial magnetic. A really severe illness, like life-threatening. Yes, really, really severe. ECT is more rapidly acting and really the, the gold standard in terms of efficacy, where for TMS, someone, uh, the, the protocol is generally going every day for weeks. Um, and so sometimes it can take a month or longer before someone knows whether they'll have any response at all. You talked about getting people well. How do you think about that? Is this kind of the the symptoms minimal symptoms under control the ability to live one's life because when you it's interesting you know other than the depakote valproic acid which you have in a very special category it sounds like many medicines are in the risk benefit assessment based on your knowledge your history and of course there's a literature which is available on that amazing website about each individual compound so i'm just interested in how you approach that question. So like, what is well enough? Yeah, what is well enough? So woman has a history of bipolar disorder, plans to get pregnant. Obviously, you're trying to keep her out of an episode, right, during pregnancy. A person has a history of depression, a person has well-controlled psychosis, a person has opiate use disorder under control, suboxone, aka buprenorphine, right? Uh, the definition of wellness is uh, was a question that came up and is, is one I'm also interested in. How do you think about that with someone? Because I know you do all your work with people, you know, so how do you think about it with them? So, um, you know, when, when people are, you know, really unwell, it's obvious, you know, but, um, uh, you know, the, the concern that we would have in, in our field in general is that, that there is a risk of having residual symptoms, so being not totally well. So people who are just sort of like scraping by, they're functioning like enough, but, you know, maybe not, you know, uh, the, you know, across arenas of their life, they're really struggling and they have residual symptoms. That's really been shown to be a major risk factor for relapse. And so the typical course of that, if someone is struggling through pregnancy, is to get very much worse rapidly in the postpartum. So that often occurs very quickly. It can often lead to very severe illness. So if it's you know someone's had a history of depression, that can often worsen incredibly rapidly in the postpartum or anxiety. We see some of the women that we see who are most ill and like suffer the most are those with postpartum anxiety and postpartum OCD. And so. Um, what we want to make sure, you know, so med medications are reasonable for a lot of the patients that we see, for most of the patients we see in our center. Um, and, and, but what we want to avoid is, is treating with medication and still having the person be ill, you know, because then we're not doing anyone any favors. The, 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 the baby is exposed to everything, your know, medicine and untreated illness. So we, we never want unnecessary medication exposures. So, you know, we don't take medication lightly during pregnancy, 
um, but we want to use it, you know, with, you know, judiciously, we want to use it with with a rationale. And so, you know, we always want to pick the medicines when possible are best known with the best reproductive safety profile. And that's a dynamic moving target. So for example, the atypical antipsychotics, which are used for um, psychotic disorders, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, treatment resistant mood disorder, you know, off label for treatment resistant anxiety, you know, for, for, for all sorts of indications, you know, we used to know nothing about those medicines. And so for some that have been available longer, we know quite a bit. And a lot of that data is reassuring. And we know some of that from our National Pregnancy Registry for Psychiatric Medications. And so we'll also give you that website. But if you um, go to our website and go to the research page, what we do is um, we enroll women during pregnancy. Um, and it's all remote, so it's by phone. And so, and we are grateful for referrals um, if, if this, you know, would pertain to anybody that you know. But we follow women with two phone calls during pregnancy and then postpartum. And we, we get a lot of data from women who are so generous to share it. And we're learning more like every day about some of the medications that have been unknown to us before. So, um, so for example, um, quetiapine, which is Seroquel, and Abilify, which is Aripiprazole, and Lorazidone, which is Latuda. We know a lot about those medicines, or at least a lot more than we used to, and we can share that data. Because what happens is, you know, we're, we're clinical researchers in our group, so we see patients in the clinic, and we have patients in our study. So we'll be in the clinic and patients will have this dilemma they're on a medicine that's not very well known during pregnancy they don't know what to do sometimes they feel so alone they just want to know has anyone ever been on this medicine during pregnancy and so they're they're often reassured to just know that there's a pregnancy registry but what's the coolest thing is to be able to say not only do we have some information we just published on this so it's you know it's it's generally a small number of patients you know we wish we had more data but we can tell you that there's not an increased risk of major malformations with exposure to this medicine in pregnancy or this class of medicines in pregnancy and uh, that means so much to people and i've actually um told people that and you know it's, um sometimes they've then enrolled in the registry to be able to share that with other women um, I've actually, you know, talked about the registry with some patients and I've had patients say, yeah, I was in that. <laughs> and uh, they're so they're so happy to have been been able to be part of something that in real time is helping other women. This is very NAMI. You take your experience and you participate in helping others, teaching others, working our classes or participating in research. Uh, you mentioned the psychosis research project. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and uh, what's happening with that particular study. So I would love to. So postpartum psychosis is generally considered a rare disorder. So affects about one or two out of a thousand pregnancies, which when you think about how many pregnancies occurred just in the US alone, it's not so rare. So you know most psychiatrists have seen a case of postpartum psychosis. Um, and so um, it often occurs pretty rapidly after delivery. It can be very severe. And as we were talking about before, you know, has terrible consequences if not treated. So it's really important that people know about it. And the experience for treatment, you know, we we virtually always recommend hospitalization, that someone is, is assessed acutely, hospitalization for safety and stabilization. And then, you know, what we know is, is that bipolar disorder is, a, is the disorder that's associated most with postpartum psychosis. So some women who have postpartum psychosis really present in a context where it's either the onset of bipolar disorder or they've had episodes before, but their sort of their long term um, treatment is for bipolar disorder. There's also a subcategory of women that appear to only have these circumscribed episodes of, of postpartum psychosis, even if it's with manic symptoms, it looks like mania with psychosis, but they've only occurred in their life in the postpartum. And some women will never have them again, but they are highly recurrent in the postpartum. So if someone's had an episode of postpartum psychosis after having one child, they're at tremendously high risk of having it again, like 80% chance of recurrence if they're not on medicine and uh, after delivery with another child. But the long-term consequences are really unknown. So we don't know at this point who needs long-term maintenance treatment for bipolar disorder 
and who does not based on, you know, if someone just presents for the first time with postpartum psychosis. So that's one of the things we're trying to really understand. So we have the MGH postpartum psychosis project and the website um, is mghp3.org. And um, the website was created with the launch of this project. So anyone who's had an episode of postpartum psychosis in the past 10 years is invited to participate with an interview and um, optionally can give um, uh, saliva for DNA sample. Um, separately, we've done, you know, some other studies, you know, really qualitative, like asking people to share their experience so we can understand the disorder better. Um, ultimately, we really wanted to advise treatment for women and really inform treatment. But in, a, in addition to launching website for this study, we have a lot of patient facing materials on that website. So a lot of um, information about postpartum psychosis for patients and their families. Um, some uh, pa patient stories who've been through it before so other people don't have to feel so alone. And we also offer for healthcare prescribers free consultations um, if they're treating someone who has postpartum psychosis and they they don't know what to do. So um, that's not for direct uh, patient care, but it's for prescribers who are taking care of patients. I'd like to ask you a little bit about, you know, the arc of your career and what you, how you see this field evolving now. Like what, how did you get interested in it? Where do you think the research is going? Obviously you're incredibly accomplished and it's fantastic what you've accomplished, but you don't even have gray hair yet like I do. So there's a future for you and your work, your research, your collaboration. So I'm just interested in how you see the field evolving over your career. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, it was a relatively new field when, when I entered it. And so, you know, a, a lot of um, uh, healthcare providers were told that women couldn't take medication during pregnancy. Um, and I think that we have a greater appreciation now with, um, you know, trying to understand the risks and benefits of medications during pregnancy. And I think a, a better appreciation, you know, you, there used to be this myth that women didn't need treatment during pregnancy that has been just totally demonstrated to be false, that women are at high risk of recurrence during pregnancy, the same as, as not during pregnancy. So pregnancy is not protective and the postpartum is exquisitely risky. You know, so, so I think we appreciate that so much more. I think we also appreciate so much more the multidisciplinary approach that has to be taken for this. So we have perinatal psychiatrists, but we'll never have enough perinatal psychiatrists, I think. So, you know, we work together with other prescribers. We work with um, therapists of all disciplines, you know, doulas, lactation consultants, OBGYNs, you know, and, you know, the, the, you know, we have to have more of a team approach, I think, to this. And so that's something that's really changed. And the other, you know, a couple other things that I think um, have, have changed is that more women, you know, come to the reproductive years having correct diagnoses and receiving treatment that really helps them. And so we're in the decision, we make more decisions about medication regimens with patients, I think, than we used to, because fortunately they're, they're diagnosed and treated. And one of the areas where this has been like, you know, so profound of a difference is, for example, like ADHD. So, you know, girls and women used to fly under the radar and not be diagnosed with ADHD. And now many women come to the reproductive years with a diagnosis and treatment, and they really want to know what to do. And so, you know, this is a, such an individual thing and, it, you know, really require, requires weighing the risks and benefits for that individual person. Um, but now we have more data, but we also have, you know, more patients who are fortunately diagnosed and treated. So the field's really expanded. And uh, there was actually a question of neurodivergence, ADHD, uh, in the uh, in the Q and A. So uh, I just was looking at your incredible website at Mass General. It's incredible. There's nothing nothing like it really. And I just saw you can click on all the vulnerabilities and uh, click on the review of the re research in ADHD and pregnancy. Like it's right there, and it's been done by uh, an expert. So you don't have to parse this on your own. And so uh, are there any other thoughts uh, that you have before we close? I mean, I heard very clearly, you know, supporting people in being well, staying away from Depakote slash Valproic acid, 
not shaming people for not breastfeeding, attending to sleep hygiene, thoughtful risk benefit assessment, and kind of a movement towards uh, acknowledging the treatment can be really helpful for many people in these circumstances. That's some of the things that I heard in this fabulous chat. What other things would you like to close with? Other remarks that you have for our audience? So I think, I mean, I think a, a last thing to close with is, you know, we, we really carefully weigh the benefits of medication exposures, but very often individuals don't think about other exposures they may have. Um, and we want to make sure that like say non-prescription things that they might be taking are held to the same standards of safety and efficacy. So for example, we see a, 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 so many more women now using cannabis products during pregnancy and, and all the data looks terrible for neurodevelopmental outcomes and pregnancy complications with that. Um, but many women don't uh, think to think about it um, in the same way. And the same thing with nutraceuticals. We wanna make sure that like for everything someone might be taking, that we really want to assess the safety and efficacy and role that it's playing for that person. So not just the prescription medication or the antidepressant for which there might be a lot of stigma and, and is getting a lot of attention, but we want to make sure the whole regimen is, is assessed similarly. Well, Dr. Freeman, I just want to thank you so much uh, for this expertise. We're cutting it a little short because she has a patient she has to attend to. And that's exactly the kind of Doctors, we love on Ask the Expert. So uh, I hope everybody uh, has enjoyed this conversation. I, I wish you the best in your career. And let's go to the next couple of slides where we're going to share with you some of the best resources ever found in for mental health things. I mean, it's really quite remarkable what this field has put together, largely Mass General, but not only Mass General. And uh, you can see them right there, Postpartum Support International. Dr. Freeman mentioned that. The MGH Center for Women's Mental Health has a very detailed research reviews. The Postpartum Psychosis Project is an international study that Dr. Freeman discussed. McPat for Moms is consultation to OBGYNs, the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline. Interesting, that's a very specific area um, of interest. The national, that's like akin to the National Suicide Hotline. Mm. So federally funded hotline that is accessible for everyone, also available in Spanish. Fantastic. So that is for people who are in crisis, whereas some of the other ones, postpartum support, are not. Is that right? So if you go to Postpartum Support International's website, they they are um, running that hotline with, you know, it's a federally funded hotline with trained clinicians answering the phone. So, um, so there's a connection between Postpartum Support International. You can find all of that on su Postpartum Support International's website in terms of the crisis line. Fantastic. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is the Center for Women's Mental Health, uh, MGH Psychiatry. There were questions about uh, hormones, menopause. We didn't get to them today because this was not our focus, but that is all being attended to on this remarkable website. Let's go to the next slide, please. And uh, that's the resource for the Postpartum Psychosis Project. Again, Nami's a big believer in trying to understand things, uh, to make sense of them, to help more people. And this is a research project that is ongoing. Next slide, please. Uh, do you want to mention anything more specific about Postpartum Support International? So um, I just would recommend that people check it out for materials for patients and families, um, as well as, you know, resources for healthcare providers. You know, they, they really do it all and advocacy as well. Great. Next slide, please. So you can see there's a lot of resources. Uh, in this area. And if you signed up for this, uh, you will get emailed uh, these slides that'll, uh, you know, make sure you have the resources. Um, next slide, please. Here's some more resources. Here's a six week online course. Uh, do you want to talk a little about the course? So the courses are really geared for healthcare providers um, of all disciplines, um, but we have that information on our website. So I won't go into too, too much. Yeah, detail. there's several people, nurse practitioners who said, how can I be more supportive or helpful? This might be that place. 
Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we'll be back with Ask the Expert on supported employment. And uh, Bob Drake essentially invented this construct, and he's going to have Peggy Swarbrick and George Bryce, who uh, got a job through supported employment. Uh, that's in April. Uh, supported employment is a best practice, but is yet, you know, underfunded uh, in our nation. So that's our next Ask the Expert. You're welcome to join us. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, Shameless Self-Promotion. This is our uh, first book, You Are Not Alone. Uh, I interviewed real people who used their names for what they had learned, which to my surprise was a gap in the literature. Uh, people use their names and share what they have learned. I also asked America's best researchers uh, to answer a common question. I asked the good Dr. Freeman uh, a question around, I have bipolar disorder, how do I approach that challenge? And she wrote an elegant answer, which required not one edit, I should add. Uh, so thank you for that as well. Uh, NAMI has the copyright, all royalties to NAMI. Uh, next, next slide, please. And announcing our new book. Uh, this is the first time we've ever mentioned it. This is the second book. Uh, Dr. Christine Crawford, our associate medical director here at NAMI, has interviewed parents, teens, and kids for what they have learned. And our second book at NAMI is You Are Not Alone for Parents and Caregivers. That'll come out in September. But I just wanted to make you aware of it. Uh, next slide, please. You Are Not Alone. And uh, if you'd like to donate to NAMI, we'll happily accept that. But all these webinars are free. And people like Dr. Freeman, whose time is incredibly valuable, donate their time in service of our shared mission. So let's go to the last slide, please. I want to thank you for joining. Uh, my name's Ken. I work for NAMI. I have a vanity license plate email address, ken at nami.org. Feel free to send me a question. Ask the Expert is manned by Katie Harris, who's done a wonderful job with her team of producing these. If you have a suggestion for a future uh, Ask the Expert, a topic that you think is compelling, an expert that you feel is you know doing great research that we should know about, feel free to send them along. So I want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, Dr. Marlene Freeman, thank you for everything you've done in your career and for sharing your expertise with us here today.